Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending on where you live. Thank you so much for joining me today on this Q&A. We haven't done one of these in quite a while, and I have some really good questions from the audience members out there and listeners of the Dojo Martial Art channel. Thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate your time. You could be doing a lot of other things. So thanks for hanging out. We'll have um, a good time, I hope. The first question is from Kieran from Cork, Ireland. He writes, do you recommend I get rubber, leather, or cotton tabby for my training, or both? That's a good question. I really think it's an individual decision, but it really depends on what type of training you're doing. I brought out some tabby here to show you the difference. So these are kind of the stereotypical ninja tabby boots that you've seen online. You probably have a pair of these. These are rubber soled and these are kind of jika tabi for outdoor use. So these are good for wearing outdoors because you have this. It has a little bit of rubberized side here so it keeps it a little bit water resistant. Cotton here and on the inside it's basically velcro to go around your ankle. These are what they call tall tabby boots so they go way up around your calf. But some people who have really thick calves, you can't wear these. You can get short tabby that kind of stop here and only go around your ankle. So those of you who have a really strong calf or thick or fat calf, you can get a shorter pair of these also online. But these are good for outdoor training. This is another variation here, which I was wearing last night. We were training outdoors. I put up a few pictures of us training with the bow last night. Oh my gosh, how much fun was it to get outside for a change and train in the beautiful sunset where we could take our mask off and just really get into the dirt with martial arts. And we were training on, on tar last night in the parking lot in the back. So I was wearing these, which are the same idea. It's got a hard bottom here, really good support for your foot. This one has an air soft type thing in it, like a Nike type air thing. So these are much more money. These are well over $100 for a pair of these from Japan. And they have the cotton top with the long here. You have the fasteners. I did another video on how to put on tabby. So if you wanna see how to put these things on, there's a lot to it. Check out the channel farther, farther. A couple years ago I did one. But these are good for outdoor training. I don't wear these in the dojo because they're not great for your budo. Now there are arguments to this. This is what I wear daily when we're training, uh, with the exception of last night where we went outside. I wear these. These are cotton tabby, which you wear indoors. These are made for indoors, not outdoors. These are made for outdoors, not indoors. At certain dojos wear the outdoor tabby inside. It's completely up to you. Whatever your thing is, go for it. But I wear these because I think these improve your taijutsu, and let me tell you why. When you wear the softer tabby, you can slide more on the mats and you're working a different muscle group when you're training in these tabby versus these. If you have a pair of shoes on that has a sole to it, an inch or two thick, you are not using the same muscle groups. Your foot is actually not touching the ground. Therefore, you're, it's not wrong, but you're using a different muscle group when you're kicking trying to balance. These are much harder to balance in. These are much easier to balance in. On our tatami mats here, which are made of kind of a vinyl rubber, when this hits the mat, it stops and it gives you little micro tears, really small tears in your muscles. Every time you do this, it, it stops your knee, it stops your ankle joint, your hips. So every time you're doing this and you can't slide, you are, I would argue, slightly, very slightly putting a lot of tension on your joints and over the years that can really cause issues with your knees, with your feet, your ankles, if you're having hip soreness. You don't get that with these, in my opinion. I've been wearing these for the last 15 to 20 years and I've noticed that my knees don't hurt. I have way better balance. My taijutsu is better. I can slide around more. Now you can argue that we don't fight in these. You're more likely to be attacked out in the street in a hard sneaker or a shoe. Correct. So I do vary back and forth. Occasionally you'll see me wear these. Occasionally you'll see me wear these. Talk to your teacher about it. This controversy. But I find that those grip the mat too hard. Micro tears on your muscle. And my taijutsu is not the same. I can't move. My Our martial art depends completely on footwork. We're never standing still. And in the rubber cotton, I can move so much better 
these, I, I feel like I'm stuck in the dirt, in the mud, and I just don't care for it much. Here are some thin-soled ones that are blue. These are really cool as far as a color scheme. But again, these hold on the mat, and it, it really, it, this is my opinion now. Don't, you know, t work these things out with your teacher and with your school and see what you like. Don't, don't walk into your school and say, well, I'm going to wear cotton now. It's, it's up to you guys. But I don't wear these much unless I'm going outdoors. There's a reason why these shoes are designed a certain way. There are also things called leather tabbies. So these are made of leather. I think I got these from Italy. Well, here's a tabby that is completely leather. Really interesting. They're okay. They're, they're not they don't fit very well because there's no structure to them. You just stick your foot in there. And of course, always always remember that when you wear tabby, you're always going to have extra length in your toes. So sometimes people's toe comes to here and then there's like an inch left. That's natural. Don't freak out about that. They make these quite long. Most people don't have too long of toes. But these are nice. I wear these indoor sometimes and they just have a little Velcro thing here that you you know, wrap your ankle with. So again, if you have a thick ank uh, thick calf issue, you can wear these. These are very expensive, probably 130, 150 bucks, maybe less. I haven't researched the prices lately, but you get what you pay for. If you're paying for hand-stitched leather, you're going to pay quite a bit. It's a luxury tool. You do not need these to train. Maybe if you're on TV or something, you might want to wear them as a cool fashion statement. And a lot of this stuff is what you like to wear. Some people wear bare feet on the mat. We don't allow it here. I think it's kind of gross. And the last thing I want is some smelly guy's foot in my face when we're ground fighting or something, but that's completely up to your school. Hopefully everyone there is clean and etc. but I just don't like to deal with bare feet. So if you train at our school, you have to wear socks on your feet. It kind of keeps a little bit of a layer between you and someone's skin cells. I did my years of training with bare feet way back then, and the older I get, I want to be more sanitary. These are the kyahan, the leggings that you've seen people wear on their ankles, which tie your gi bottom to your ankles to keep it tight. Uh, I wear these only when I go outdoors. I didn't wear them last night, but I should have worn them. Working with the bow, you don't want your gi pants to stick out like bell bottoms, or your weapon will get caught in those, and you'll often hit your bow in your cuff, and it will go flying. It's plus, they keep the ticks out the bugs out, the, the plants out. I wear these when I go into the field or the woods to keep ticks out of my legs and things like that. But these you can buy, they're called Kyahan, K-Y-A-H-A-N. They're basically leggings. They're cool, and they make them all different styles, some with Velcro, some with the tabs. It's personal choice. So that's a good question about tabby. My opinion, do I get rubber, leather, or cotton? Buy a couple if you can afford it and just see what you like on your dojo mats or what you like, but if you're going outdoors, you can't wear the cotton or you're going to get all muddy and, and wet. My opinion is I wear the cotton indoor and the rubber outdoor. That's what they were designed for. That's a great question from Kieran from Cork, Ireland. Thank you so much. Banger788, do you advocate for firearms training? If so, thank you. There seems to be a gap between martial artists and gun nuts, no? My friend always threatens to pull out his pistol when we discuss self-defense. I always joke that you have to get your gun first. He is convinced that a gun is best. Any thoughts? Yes, I do advocate firearms training. Firearms are a modern weapon. They are a modern tool that the military, police uses, and the modern citizen, at least here in America, where they are legal. There are many, many countries where guns are prohibited, including Japan. But here in America, we are bathed in guns since childhood. I remember plunking around with BB guns when I was a kid with my father and brother, and then we graduated to a shotgun, started at a 16 gauge, and then moved to the big 12 gauge, even a 10 gauge, and then you might go into sporting rifles and things like that. It's part of our culture. Therefore, to ignore firearms training would be kind of foolish, in my opinion, if you're going to call yourself a self-defense enthusiast. We are at a luxury here of having wonderful gun ranges that you can go to to practice with firearms, and I often go there and bring different types of pistols, rifles, shotguns. They have indoor and outdoor ranges. 
they're quite restrictive here so you can't like fast shoot or anything or you get yelled at by the gun range officer there if you're lucky enough to have an outdoor gun range oh that's great because you can really do some more tactical things where you can roll around and clear rooms and things like that it's really good to have you don't want someone to throw you a pistol and you don't even know how to rack the slide or where the button is to for the mag release and things like that you want to be familiar with the weapon enough that under duress you could at least hopefully save your life now should you have a gun it's completely up to you and your family discuss it with them some people are anti-gun some people are pro-gun i am pro second amendment because it's a modern tool and for me to be a martial art teacher it would be stupid of me to ignore guns and firearms where they're so readily available. You're more likely to run into a gun than a, a sword like behind me. However, a lot of knife deaths as well as sword deaths on the news, so I practice with all kinds of weapons. I never understood the criticism of people saying, why do you work on this weapon? It's so stupid and you don't encounter that. Yes, you do. You can encounter everything. Everything that I pick up, everything around me, can be used as a weapon and that is not that is not uh, something that I shy away from everything is a weapon Every, everything to the martial artist insight is a weapon so I have 25 weapons around me here in the desk well it's a tool but it could be used to save your life Firearms are the same. I love them. I'm not obsessed with them. I only own maybe four or five different guns, but uh, I respect them highly. I never understood the conflict between gun guys and sword guys because we should be brothers and sisters. We should support each other. I have good friends in the gun in industry who are my sensei, my teachers, because I'm no firearms expert. So when I go and train, I open myself up to what they're teaching me and I listen and I take notes and I learn why people attack each other is just ego. It's machismo where the gun guy will say, well, you gotta, you gotta get through my 1911 to get to me. And the, of course the martial artist is like, look, I could have beaten you up 10 times before you even grabbed your pistol. 21 foot rule people argue about. Why argue? Life is short. Just embrace your brothers and say, look, I like to train in unarmed combat as well as firearms. You don't like unarmed combat. You only like firearms. I think I have an advantage. If I train in several fields of self-defense and you train in one and you barely train, you go to the range every month and you shoot at paper targets, that's not real self-defense because your target's moving, nobody stands still, you miss a million times. Someone who's really into self-defense will want to go deeper into these subjects and talk about tactics and what if questions. What if my gun jams? Now what do I do? The guy's got a knife, I'm dead if I don't train in martial arts. The guy gets me in a chokehold. You're dead if you don't train in martial arts. You have to train unarmed combat as well as firearms, tactical defense, things like that. And all of my military friends completely agree with that. Why limit yourself? A gun is best at dis distance, of course. If you can shoot a bow and arrow at 100 yards, why would you punch them? Makes sense. But I want to train in martial arts of all distances. Close combat, grappling, punching, medium distance, knife defenses, gun defenses, how to shoot a rifle, whatever it is, how to shoot a shotgun. I want to know it all because I want to be well-rounded in this field. Yes, I am an advocate for firearms, but check with your local laws because many people have never held a gun in their life. They don't understand the culture of it, therefore they are afraid of it. My opinion is when you learn different types of martial art tools or self-defense tools, the fear goes away. And the ultimate intelligent person that I respect the most is one who can see both sides of each argument he or she has done the research they have debated enough to know that look there are two sides to everything jeremy asks did i see a three-sided jute in the background of your video it is awesome i've never seen one yes i have a couple jute here what is that well this is a jute spelled sometimes j-u-t-t-e ju as in ten and te as in hand. I've seen it spelled J-I-T-E, J-I-T-T-E, many, many different things. But this is called a jute. This is from the Edo period, from 1603 forward. 
This is a legitimate jute. There are thousands of them. This one's made of iron. It's a truncheon. And as you can see, it's very pitted, it's very old and rusted. Just a hunk of iron here with this kagi prong here. It's a cool thing. It was a martial art weapon, what they call the tool of the bushi, and I have several here. I've heard it called teto, which means iron sword. The power of ten hands. Whoever wielded this could have been a constable, could have been a military person, an inspector of the hotel, an inspector of rice. It was a status symbol, and often in castles, you weren't allowed to bring a sharp object into the castle, perhaps a tanto or a wakizashi, but certainly not a katana. Therefore, the guards in the castle would carry these so that if you became obstinate or something, they would use this to wrestle you to the ground because these hooks could be used in your gi, in your helmet, in the straps of your helmet. They could whack you with it, knock you out. They could uh, get your fingers caught in here. You could catch a sword in the tine here or stop a blade. Just wearing one of these, you knew that this guy was a high-level constable or police officer of some sort, and they would wear these as a status symbol, as well as a self-defense tool. And there are thousands of them out there. They're anywhere from 100 to $5,000, depending on it. This is called the Khan, or the edge here, and this could be bashed. You have the, uh, the Kagi here, again, which could be caught. You have the yoku, the tine, the, the, the tip. You have the habaki collar, the mono uchi, the shaft here to bash people with. Here is a modern jute. These you can find all over the internet. Cheaply made. A little bit of a sharp point here. A little tassel here to confuse the opponent, or perhaps the tassel had some sort of color scheme to it to tell you what ryu they were from. The Ito wrap could have been different colors. These are mass produced and you can buy these online for 20, 20 to 50 bucks. Cool little things to wear. So this is the one you were talking about. This is a san kagi. San meaning three kagi hook. As far as the jute, there are many different types. You have ones without any prongs, just a iron rod, a truncheon. You have ones with one, you have ones with two, three. I've seen as many as five or six. This is a three-sided one. It wouldn't be comfortable to wear in your obi belt. I love the design of that. Three opportunities to catch a sword rather than one. That way if I'm at a different angle or something I might be able to catch it. But very uncomfortable to wear in your belt, sticking in your belly all day. Very cool tool. Now people always say, well what's the difference between the sai and the jute? Here's a sai. Sai was an Okinawan weapon, but it was far older than that. My guess is the Sai predated the Jute. It probably went into Okinawa and up into Japan. But the Sai has been around in Indian culture through Buddhism and uh, all kinds of different religions had gods and deities that carried a truncheon like this. So the Sai, my guess is it predated the, the Jute. Who knows? We weren't there. Who really cares when you think about it? They're just cool to have. So unlike the uh, Ninja Turtles, this was used in Japan. This might have been used in China, Okinawa, the islands, and India, Middle East, probably anywhere where different religions had these as tools or self-defense weapons. They're around all over the place. But you can find these all over the internet. Just search Jute, J-U-T-T-E, -T -T -E on eBay, and you'll find all kinds of variants from 100 to $2,000 of different ages. I like this one because it has history. Who knows if this jute was used by a constable somewhere and perhaps it was used in battle. We don't know, but the mystery of it is really interesting to me, the history of these things. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll do a video on the kabuto, the helmet splitter, and the jute at some other point because there's something called a kabuto wadi or hachi wadi which was made to split skulls. It's a, it's a different type of weapon. Modern day, you have this, which is a baton. And you could argue that those were just simple police batons back then. Here is a collapsible baton. Here that's several inches long. So this is a modern baton that police sometimes carry. Look at that tip. You wouldn't, wouldn't want to get hit in the face with that thing. Using this this way to bash each other, self-defense. People carry these when they're jogging around. So you have these collapsible batons that are able to put in your pocket, your coat pocket. And these are cool and I'm not sure about legality of these in different states, but this is a modern jute. 
modern jeté, which a lot of uh, police officers still carry to this day, these batons. Great question. The Noto video question, how do I keep the sword from stabbing my hand when I'm putting it back in the saya? This is a good question. When you have a sword, this is a shinken. Shinken means live blade. So a shinken is sharp, an iaito is not. There are many ways to put your sword back. Please be careful. With Noto, people really get arrogant when they're talking about how to put the sword back in the scabbard. Ultimately, who cares? When you think about it, if the opponent is dead, what difference does it make how you put your sword back? It, it doesn't. But over the years, all these schools opened up in Japan when people were bored after, in the Edo period after the samurai became unemployed. They opened sword schools and they would go into great detail on this is how we do it and this ryuha and you must do it our way. This is what separates us, which makes us better from the other school. We hold the sword this way and we hold it that way. It's really not important. Do whatever your teacher tells you to do with whatever school and system you do to feel part of that group. I'm of the opinion, put it back however you want as long as you get it done. I'm, I'm a results person, not about the method of getting there. For me, since age seven, when I picked up my first sword, I was taught I have five different sword teachers and they all have a different method. For me, I was taught to pull the blade here along the webbing into the koiguchi and when the tip falls it's it's in there you're good to go but some people say don't touch the blade they don't know what they're talking about you touch the blade constantly you clean the blade when you're done training just like a gun do you touch the slide of a gun can you imagine someone arguing that you never touch the slide of the uh, or the barrel or anything of course you do you clean it afterwards it's it's a tool it's meant to be touched what they meant was, as far as etiquette, is you don't want to pick up someone's blade and take it out and grab it. If it's a $10,000 sword, you wouldn't want to grab their blade disrespectfully. But doing yaijutsu and kenjutsu, you touch your sword constantly, but you wipe it to keep it from rusting and you get the oil off of it. As far as noto, it's just a matter of practice. Consult with your teacher. There are a hundred videos of different styles online of how to put the sword back. I am unconventional and unorthodox and I have three different ways I do it. Sometimes I pinch the blade, sometimes the blade doesn't touch my skin at all when it goes in, but it's, it's just thousands of hours of practice. You will not stab your hand, you will not stab the webbing after so many tries. The worst thing you can do is turn the blade over. You will cut yourself with the kinetic energy this way. But you just have to feel it and do it in the dark a thousand times and you'll get it, okay? It's just a matter of practice, as with everything in life, you and I both know that capital P word, practice is the answer to almost everything. Our questions are often answered in practice and trial and error. If you have a teacher, you're ahead of the game, but practice your Iaido, your Noto, get a, an Iaito, which isn't sharp. But even on the Iaito, the, uh, the Kasaki, the tip is often very sharp. You have to dull it down. I often have to dull my the tips of my sword. Get a wooden sword with a scabbard. There are answers to all these things. If you are interested enough to practice and put the time in, the answers will all, always come to you. Do you ever go to, did you ever go to Taikai's back in the day? Yes, I did. I heard that they were legendary and great training. I am too young. I was born in 1990 to have gone to them from Nate in Lakewood, Colorado. Yeah, Taikai's, Nate, were really, really fun. They were huge events, giant gatherings of martial arts enthusiasts of all different types of martial arts around the world, wherever Hatsumi Sensei went and the other Shihan, we would follow them around the country. So I've been to Taikai's in New York, uh, Texas, Atlanta, California, um, Ohio. Uh, Taikai's were everywhere, Washington, D.C., I mean, they were everywhere. Taikais happened once or twice a year. They were the basic big event of the year, and we would go to these. You'd spend several hundred dollars. You'd get a hotel room with a bunch of people. You'd hang out and train for three or four days, take tons of notes. Then you would go home. Often we didn't have a dojo way back then, and we'd just go home and train. Then you'd save up money, get another job, fly out or drive out. We would often, I drove to Texas a couple times, spend hours and hours going to training. This is why sometimes it's hard for me to understand why someone who lives a half an hour away complains about driving to the dojo in their car and they don't know that 
back in the day, this is the uphill in the snow, old man story, we would drive 24 hours each way to get to the destination to train for two days to get one page of notes. That's all we had, no internet, no computer. You had to work your butt off to find the Taikai, spend the $1,000 or whatever it was, save up the money as a 17-year-old kid, which I did, S stay in a stinky tent somewhere or hotel room, break down on the road, fly, all these things just to get a little bit of knowledge. It was difficult back then. Nowadays, there are no excuses that anyone can come up with to match the difficulty we had going to these events when they were hard and expensive to get to. But Tai Kai's, wow, great event. Not the best training because the Shihan didn't know a lot. Well, they knew a lot, obviously more than us, but compared to 30 years later, their Taijutsu was more basic, but powerful. We, we beat the hell out of each other at these events. You would go home so bruised and beaten and tired and exhausted, but we loved it. we go back the next month and do another. The training was harder back then, less liability, people weren't so afraid of pain as they are now, less wokeness and things like that. Fun times, great times, you never forget your martial art brothers and sisters who went with you. Some are still my friends to this day, almost 40 years later. Taikai will not happen anymore, Hatsumi is near the end of his life at age almost 90. He doesn't train anymore. But those are just uh, something that you had to be there in the ninja boom of the 1980s. It was just a different time. Could there be different Taikais? Sure. And there will continue to be with the other Shihan and instructors who are a generation younger and who still want to bring this around. There'll be more. There'll be more. So keep an eye out for these Taikai events. Bodyweight asks, do you know of any dojos in Vegas that would be good? The one I used to do kendo at 12 years ago closed. I'm sorry to hear that. But they are all kinds of different martial arts, and most of what I see is more big-name, commercialized places. And I like the small dojo feel and love your channel. Man, thank you for the content. Thank you, uh, Body Weight. I don't know of any dojos in Vegas. Everything is research, so if you live there, just Google stuff, ask around. Don't limit yourself too much of the style of martial art, because what we do is very unique, and it's rare. So there might be way more sport martial arts than self-defense martial arts. Sometimes you have to just take what's in your area. It's better to train in something rather than nothing. So don't be too picky that you won't train because it's not exactly what you want. You have to adapt to the style that's being taught to you. But don't close your mind too much that you're not going to train at all. Because as you and I know, zero training is no good. Some training in martial arts is better. It's, remember what I say, a white belt is a higher level than someone who sits on their couch. If you're training in a martial art, find something locally in the area that you live and try it out. Take a week of classes, see if you like it, or a month. Always train for a month. A week isn't enough. A whole month is enough to make an assessment that that school is for you. But thank you for the compliments, but I don't know of anything in Vegas. Just search around. Search around. You'll find something. Red Baron Pilot, what weapon killed the most people in ancient Japan? I don't know because we weren't there. Uh, historians argue. My guess is what's probably the Yumi, the bow and arrow, because the bow and arrow has been around for so long. I would imagine that over the period of decades and centuries that the bow and arrow probably took more lives than anything. You could argue, well, the stick's older, but how many people are beaten with a stick? The bow probably the, is my guess. The spear was huge as well. It took way more lives than the sword. Remember, swords were a secondary weapon, just like military now. If I can shoot a missile from a battleship, I'll do that from 100 miles away. If you're uh, a sniper and you're shooting your rifle from, I don't know how many yards, 300 yards, that's better than getting hand-to-hand -hand combat with some somebody. Back then was the same. If I can shoot you with a bow and arrow, good. Or an, a, uh, a rifle or something. So guns probably took a lot of lives uh, in the period where the guns entered into Japan. Swords, I'm sure, took a lot. All kinds of different weapons, but my guess is the bow and arrow. It's my guess. And maybe the spear after that, and then whatever pole arms they use, swords, and then lesser would be things like knives and stuff like that. But I, I wasn't there. No one was. So it's all speculation. But we can assume that the longest weapon probably took the most lives. 
Ashby Falls, have you ever practiced ninja aruki, stealth movements, and do you teach it at your school? Yes, we do practice how to move your feet because it teaches you how to balance before you're kicking and how to grip the ground, how to move silently, unseen, so to speak. Aruki skills are part of our budo. We move our feet constantly in our martial art. We call it playing chess because you're always moving into squares. If I want to take the opponent's square, I have to bolt into it. If he's attacking me and he's huge and strong and fast, I need to angle back into a, a diagonal square, like a bishop. Uh, in some cases, I just need to move to the side, like a rook or something. So, aruki we use constantly. The koto ryu, the gyoko ryu, both have different methods of walking. Do I teach the stealth walking in the ninjutsu aspect? No. My students have no interest in that. My job is to serve my students with what they want. If they want powerful self-defense and philosophical teachings that can get them through the day and help our lives become better and more fulfilling with purpose, that way outweighs these ancient ninja things like making smoke bombs and how to make a fire. These things just don't apply in modern day society as they did back then. You're more beneficial at taking a class on Microsoft Word than you are with some of these. Um, I'm, I'm not disrespecting the old methods. I know a lot of them. In the 90s, that's almost exclusively what we did. We did all this ninja stuff. But nowadays, my students just aren't interested in it. Therefore, the knowledge goes into the shadow and the things that are more practical come into the front. How do I deal with someone who's mounted on top of me, punching me? How do I deal with being bullied online by people texting me? These are more important things than how to make a snorkel and survive underwater by being chased by samurai warriors. You can see my context with this. I'm not disrespecting it, but I have to teach with my limited time here on Earth what is more applicable to the people in our community. Jiu-Jitsu Saginaw. I wonder if that's Saginaw, Michigan. I am a brown belt in Jiu-Jitsu. That's fantastic. It's really hard to get the purple, brown, and black belt in Jiu-Jitsu. Very good. I really dig your channel and content. Thank you. I feel as though you are a kind of father figure to me. Thanks for that. I never knew mine. I saw your videos that you do not wear your rank belts. Is that for a purpose? Why is that? Thanks for all you do, Caleb. Caleb, thank you so much. I'm glad you see me as a father figure. I have people on the internet that I look up to as well as kind of heroes and role models. I love YouTube, don't you? You can find so many channels with such good content by people who years ago had never been exposed to the news or a network. There are so many, uh, kind of personal guru that I watch. Maybe someday I'll share some. But my guru and teachers are not the same interests that you have. But I'm honored, Caleb, that you would think that way. I'm so happy that you're a brown belt in jiu-jitsu. That is fantastic. Send me some pictures. Or when you get your black belt, let me know, please. I'd like to help celebrate that. I love all martial arts. And the, when people argue from one martial art to the other, it really saddens me to see that. This channel focuses on the positive aspects of martial arts. We're not out to bash people. I may disagree with martial arts, but jujitsu, Aikido, Karate, Kung Fu, you name it. They are beautiful arts and I respect them all as well as my own. Do I think the one I study is the best? Of course I do, because I've studied many others and this is the only martial art I have found for me that had all of the boxes checked. But that doesn't mean it should be your martial art. You pick the one you like. Often people don't care of the style. They like the people. They like the teacher. They like the studio. They like the activity of it. Great. Do all of that. I don't wear my rank. I don't wear my... I haven't worn my black belt in... 17 years. 16 years, really. I only wear it to hold my weapons in my belt because it's just a personal decision that the black belt promotes ego. And so many people I know that wear the black belt are lazy, they don't train, they stand around, they think they're the grand poobah, they call themselves master and grandmaster and all these things. In my opinion, the black belt is nothing more than a dirty white belt. A black belt is a white belt who didn't quit. That's it. I, c I could feel sometimes years ago when I wore my belt that I was 
puffing my chest out and I didn't want to do the hard rolling on the mat or get down and, and roll around on the dirt because I felt that the black belt was a status symbol for laziness. And it isn't. It's just showing how little we know. Now, wear your black belt. If you're a black belt, be proud of it. It is a wonderful accomplishment, but it's only the beginning step. The name black belt is called Shodan, literally first step. It's not the tenth step. It's not the hundredth step. It is the first step in your training. Wear your black belt if your school requires it. I own the school, so I don't have to wear my belt. Aside from two back surgeries, which is painful, um, I just don't wear my belt. I am a beginner, always will be, always will be a student before a teacher. Yes, I know a hell of a lot about martial arts, but I will never feel that I'm good enough. And for me personally, I don't wear it. I only wear it occasionally to wear, to hold my swords in, or if we're doing certain throws where you grab the obi and throw, certain judo throws, I'll, I'll wear it. But don't let any of that influence you. You wear what you want, when you want, how you want. You ask the question, that's why I'm sharing it with you, but it's just a personal thing for me. Nobunaga Jibei. I saw a guy called Nindo on YouTube. Nindo, have you seen it? A lot of it appeared to be cringy and cheesy and stereotypical ninja magic garbage. Is it legit? Jinichi Kawakami is someone who claims to be the head of the Bankei Shinobi Den. He claims to be the 21st Soke of the Kokaban Ninjutsu. I don't know. People that claim things I'm skeptical of. I've watched the channel. Again, this is my opinion, and I just, just said we don't make fun of other people, but it's not for me. I don't think his Taijutsu's at a high level, but it's his life. He can make a channel. When somebody says, I've learned from childhood from a master who's no longer around, be skeptical of that. I don't trust anybody who says, I learned as a child on the mountaintop, like Batman with Liam Neeson. Be skeptical of these claimants that say they're a master or a soke of something, and then their master, there's no photographic evidence, no pictures of. I don't know if this guy's legit or not. He might be. The channel is entertaining. Uh, yes, a lot of it can be cheesy and stereotypical. But hey, whatever floats your boat, if you want to watch the Nindo channel, go for it. And if you want to go to Japan and train with him, I'm sure you can. Is the, he's the 21st Soke of the Kokaban Ninjutsu? I don't know. The point of all of this is life is short, you guys, and whatever you want to do, don't let people deter you. The questions, the skepticism, the answers will come. If you want to spend time following somebody, go for it. Who am I to say, or who are you to say for me, what we can and can't study with our life? It's our choice. That's the freedom of it. Check him out. See what you like. Another question. Are you teaching Toshin Do? Are you teaching Bujin Khan? Are you teaching Jinan Khan, Genbu Khan? I see aspects of all four of them in your Taijutsu. I love your videos and no-nonsense approach to ninjutsu. Best channel out there. Keep up the good work. Scott Z. Thank you, Scott. What we are here is kind of an amalgam of all of those. Are we Bujin Khan? Somewhat. Are we Toshindo? Somewhat. Are we Jinankan? Somewhat. Are we Genbukan? Somewhat. I, I've trained with these teachers of these, the leaders of these styles for decades. Therefore, I'm going to steal from all of them and put it into our curriculum. What I deem as uh, realistic and legitimate, I put in our curriculum. What I think is bunkum and junk and outdated, I jettison and discard. In our curriculum, we were just talking about last night, we have to update it constantly depending on the culture and how weaponry and clothing and situations of our culture changes. This is an adaptive martial art. Yes, last night out back we studied Kukishin Bojutsu, but I adjust it to depending on the distancing and the environment and the weather and things like that. Yes, I have high ranks in Bujinkan, Toshindo, so therefore I, I respectfully take from my beloved teachers and I use it here. But I don't fall into the politics and the webs of rigmarole of organizations. Our dojo is autonomous, although we are friends, dear friends, with all of them. I just talked to Mr. Hayes, talked to Arno from Paris, talked to my Japanese friends, friends from all over the world who are doing their own thing as I am here. 
And our dojo is special because we blend together traditional and modern Budo and Bujutsu to what applies. Do we have weaknesses here? Oh my gosh, yes. Do we have holes in our training? Heck yes. Do we need to improve in certain areas? My God, yes. All of these. Do we have something unique? Absolutely. I don't know of anybody who is teaching these different arts together without conflict and trying my best to interpret and translate these arts into the 21st century for what we need here. At the same time, are you a traditionalist? Yes. Are you a progressive in the martial arts? Yes. Try to be everything and unlabelable if there's such a thing. To the dismay of some who are purists who say, oh, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that, you're poisoning this, you're doing that. I don't care what people say. I'm too old. I'm in my 50s now. I'm going to do it my way. It's worked well. We are still going after 15 years. We're a lot of dojos who stuck to the tradition of closed. So we must be doing something right. When I can see a nine-year-old child stand up to a bully or a 17-year-old girl defend herself against someone who's gone too far, I've done my job. And nothing people can say is going to deter me and us as a team here from using the best of each martial art to the best of our ability to serve our community. Master Norcross, please don't call me that. Have you ever taught military personnel? Yep, I've done combat instruction for the military three times and enjoyed it tremendously. What fantastic role models they were. Yes, sir, very respectful, very humble, even though they were powerful warriors and willing to learn. The recruits and the people that I trained in unarmed combat were so nice. I am so humbled at how they serve our country, protecting us, um, going to the worst places in the world, regardless of whatever political interest or anything. I so respect the military. I literally bow as deep as I can to anyone who is serving our country and to have had the honor to show them some martial arts where they haven't seen it before, I was just blown away and I have a beautiful civilian service award on the wall and I'll never forget the memory and the friends that I made teaching those military personnel. I hope you guys are enjoying yourself. Let me get my mouse here, which is buried under Tabby. <laughs> and we'll continue. I hope you're not too bored and you're enjoying yourself as I am. Legend Day 4. I hear you reference Lord of the Rings a lot in your videos. Are you a big fan of Tolkien? Do you own his books? Do you like Peter Jackson's trilogy? Have you seen The Hobbit? Ever seen the Rankin Bass cartoons? I wish they had more martial arts fighting in it. Yes, Legend Dave, I'm just going to call you Dave. I love Lord of the Rings because, yes, I read the books. I have the books. I really am not a big fan of um, fiction much. Most of my library at home has nonfiction books. I don't know why it's a curse. Some of you out there might be the same. I really need to be learning when I'm reading. For me to pick up The Hobbit, I get bored very quickly and I fall asleep, to be honest with you. And sometimes you know how you read? You read something when you're tired. You read the same paragraph like 10 times. You're just not absorbing the information. I have to be in the right mood for those. But yeah, I love Tolkien because they're archetypes and all of us out there need archetypes to push ourselves forward in life toward our dreams. Without archetypes, how can we be inspired? And for me, the Lord of the Rings really hit home when I was a young person in the 1970s. I saw the Rankin Bass, the Hobbit, and the Return of the King, and I love that animation, the hand-drawn Rankin Bass cartoons. I'll never forget when we had a first colored television and it was a big hunking box of wood and I would lay on the thick carpet on a rainy day with a bowl of ravioli and my mother uh, in the kitchen doing whatever and I was just so comfortable watching The Hobbit by Rankin Bass and I was pulled into that show. And to this day I own the Blu-ray of The Hobbit by Rankin Bass and Return of the King. Wonderful cartoons that just pulled me into that world. Yeah, they're cheesy, but they still, to me, are a wonderful memory. Uh, Peter Jackson did a good job at interpreting Tolkien in his way. They're his version. Loved them. Remember going to the movies with friends and being so excited to see them on the big screen. Did I see The Hobbit? I saw The Hobbit, didn't like it, 
certain parts were awesome, but you know what I would have thought was cool, and you might agree? How cool would it have been to have Guillermo del Toro do his version of The Hobbit and then give the money to Jackson and have him do his interpretation of The Hobbit and force him and say, look, it's going to be max of two movies. Here's your budget, go. Equal budget, different visions. I would love to see a series like The Hobbit or um, maybe a Marvel or DC or something, maybe a uh, Harry Potter, whatever it is, some sort of um, trilogy. Give it to two or three directors and then let them make their own movie and then have them compete in the market to see which is better. Wouldn't that be awesome to see Del Toro's version come to life and Jackson's and have the ability to watch them both. I've never seen that happen, but that would be awesome to watch and just see how they work out. But yes, loved Lord of the Rings. The archetypes and martial arts that attracted me and probably many of you who are old men now and women were Shokosugi. Shokosugi, uh, Toshira Mifune here, Shokosugi, um, Kosugi, Shintaro Katsu, Tomasaburu Wakayama as Lone Wolf and Cub, Ogami Ito. These guys were my, were my Tolkien. They were my Hobbit. Shokosugi, my gosh, I loved him. Mifune, anything with these old Japanese actors. Sadly, most of them are dead now. These guys who became a reluctant hero like Zatuichi, Lone Wolf and Cub, when the Yagyu clan set him up murdered his wife, and now he's stuck raising his small child, the cub of Lone Wolf and Cub, bringing his child into the Hades and seeing all these horrible parts of humanity and having the burden of raising a son while you're defending yourself. These archetypes are just everywhere, and they're fantastic at keeping the small kids in us focused on something we want to be. There's no shame in saying that I want to be like this person. I, I have a hero. Uh, just know that heroes will fail you. We're all human. But the idea of finding archetypes through books, through, through comics and anime and movies and television are good things and healthy things that all of us need to bring hope to the world and to bring our dreams to fruition. Archetypes like Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, whatever you grew up with, Batman, Superman, go for it. I think they're healthy. Our old friend Quixart, who is uh, Taha. Good afternoon, Sensei. It's me, Taha, from Florida, who won our Tanto a few months ago. I just want to ask a question about my Tanto you gave me. I have been studying about Japan and its weapons history, such as the Yumi Bow, the Ari Spear. I have found that my Tanto is more curved than my Boken and my friend's Uchigatana. What's the reason for this curve and why is it more curved than other blades? Taha, my guess is it's just differential tempered. Whoever made that blade, it just happened to curve more, perhaps more clay here and there. The curved blade versus the straight Chokuto blade is interesting. Um, I prefer curved blades, but both will do the cutting or stabbing equally. But the reason yours is curved is just the manufacturer's desire with that particular blade. Curved blades um, have a good edge alignment. They were probably created through differential tempering with the clay, and when you quench it, the hardness of the uh, steel goes down and then it bends up. It's really interesting to watch. But there was also differential hardening in Chokuto straight blades, which predated the curved blade from China. So were they used, was a curved blade better at cutting? Not necessarily. From cavalry and horseback, would a curved blade have done more damage? We don't know. The katana is not that curved compared to some of them I've seen from the Middle East. Uh, but with linear expansion, the hard carbon blade compresses and then it gives you that curve depending on how quick the steel cools down will change the way the shape is because uh, if the spine is covered in clay it cools down faster. The reason I, ju I just can't really answer that. I don't know why your tanto is more curved than others but it has to do with the quenching process, the differential hardening of the smith's desire. Chris asks or mentions since COVID is ending and things are opening back up, I'm happy. I was thinking I want to open a dojo where I live. As a dojo owner, can you tell me, is it better to borrow money for a retail space or to start in a warehouse environment? Any advice would be much appreciated. 
Chris, that's a good question. There are two philosophies in owning a business as far as a martial art. A couple things I've learned that might help out. If you have the capital, capital is key in opening any business. If you have the funds to get a retail commercial space, go for it because more cars are going to drive by, more people will see it, better free advertising. You will have more clients. If you open up in a warehouse environment, which would be cheaper rent, let's be honest, you might get more space, higher ceilings, cheaper utilities, but you're going to be farther away from where the people are. So you will have to do more online or even print advertising to bring people into your door. People are not going to drive into the boondocks to train at your dojo if it's an hour away from where they live or work. Convenience matters with a business and any intelligent business person knows this. How do you get the capital? I can't answer that. You're going to have to work your butt off for years to get it. Unless you're fortunate enough to have a rich uncle or something that will lend you a hundred grand to open up a dojo. You can also start small, which is a training club, and work your way up. Build your student base. Start with one friend who lives next to you, and then eventually you get two friends, three friends. If you're a good teacher, you'll get five and ten. And then you build out your dojo from the ground up. Start in a garage, start in a basement where rent is free. Train in the backyard or out in the woods or at the local park, at your local church. You can rent a space, your YMCA. Then you build your way up into the retail market, which is way more expensive and very rare for someone to succeed in. I know so many friends who have closed their school this last year because they couldn't survive. Why? Because COVID hit. And if you have less than 50 students, good luck. Because 50 of them will leave you or 40 of them will quit. They have to. They were forced to shut down in America. We were forced by law to close our doors. You were not allowed to keep your dojo going. We had to shut down for almost a month. Then we moved to Zoom training and then we're, we've been back in action since, I don't know, June or July. A lot of dojos couldn't afford the rent. They had to shut down. And as business owners, a lot of them are very proud. Small business owners often won't share with you how financially destitute they are. They're proud. You say, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. We're, we're doing all right. And then a month later, they shut their doors. This happens everywhere. I saw four local friends lose their martial art dojos. How we survived here at the dojo, I have no idea. Part of it is because we're well established, so we have 150 students active. Therefore, we could afford to pay our bills when 40 of them quit. We also adapted to the times and used Zoom and online training. Although I'm not a fan of it, we had to do it to survive. We had to work around things. We had to do more private lessons, more free lessons, more um, free classes and things like that. We had to adapt in all kinds of different ways. And we have a great product here. Our martial art works. It's effective. And people from all walks of life, all ages, all body types, all come to this dojo as a safe haven, as a place to train and learn while having a good time and making new friends and, and having purpose in life. And there's nothing that makes me more proud than seeing people come to this place, which is kind of like a church without the religion. They come here to train, to learn, to feel more confident, to gain strength and flexibility, balance, and purpose in their life. And rather than just going to work in a mundanity, they can come here after work and de-stress and get rid of anger and really become good martial artists over the years. All while laughing and having a great time, feeling young and healthy, learning. Oh my gosh, it's just incredible to see. But my advice to you is start small and work your way up unless you are fortunate enough to have the capital to open a school. Most schools will not make it. I don't know the percentages, but most dojos will close, just like restaurants and any other place. But to regret not taking the chance would be worse. Try it. If you fail, it's okay. But at least you tried to open your school. You wouldn't want to be 80 years old and regretting not, o not trying to open a school. And then I know some people who open schools who are they're just too young and people don't follow. This is the truth, you guys. A lot of people won't follow a 23-year-old school owner because they don't feel that he has the experience of a 50-year-old person. But there are always cases that defy that rule. There are successful 21-year-old school owners and there are guys that are 60 that fail. Don't worry. It's a good question, though. Good luck. 
Ariel from Juno, Alaska. Mr. Norcross, I love your videos, especially on philosophy. I don't study the martial arts, but may I ask, what is your secret to a happy life? Ariel, to make it quick, no life that you see on Facebook or Instagram is a real life. We post pictures of the best part of our life. You see all these happy couples, everything's perfect. No life is like that. There is no secret to happiness. There are things we can do. For me, this is what has helped me at least remain free of suffering to the best of my ability, yet I still have it. Gratitude. Being grateful for what we have instead of bitching and moaning of what we don't have. That's half the battle. Looking around and knowing if you have basic food and shelter, clothing, you're good to go. You have freedom, you're good to go. Understanding geological time. Knowing that you and I's life is literally like the flea on the flea of a flea of the back of a flea's. How quick our life is here and there, it's quick. Geological time, study that, study cosmology, and it keeps us realizing how quick our life is and how we just have to let go and enjoy each day. It is a gift, it is precious. When you understand that humankind around for 300,000 years or more, your life is meaningless as is mine. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but just know that, look, just read, look at any famous person. You think their life is great, they're rich, they're wealthy, they have fame. They get a 10 second blurb on the news and their life is gone. Therefore, it teaches us to relax more, to let go of anger, frustration and sadness and just enjoy each day because these days are numbered and we are heading toward the process of death. It's another thing, study death. Study the process of death. Don't think that it's morbid. It is healthy to do. It is a cycle. As soon as you and I are born, we're headed that way. So study about it. Study, study, study. And understand death so it doesn't scare us. What we're afraid of is the process, the pain. But the process of dying is as natural as it can be. We're all headed there. Learning. Learn something new. Study martial arts. Whatever you love to do, learn, learn, learn. That's a key, I believe, to happiness. Learning how to laugh. Not taking ourselves seriously. That's what I meant by studying geological time. Laughter is the key to everything. Don't take things so seriously. Turn the news off. Become one with nature more. Breathe more. Laugh more. What makes you happy? Pay attention to each moment. Each moment. Each moment. The future, the past, are things that we don't have control over within reason. Can't control my past. Let it go. Work towards something in the future. That's great. But it's also a curse knowing that we're going to die, whereas the dog or the cat might have no clue, and that's why they're happier, because they don't know when they're going to die. They, they might not be conscious of it. But be comfortable with the death process, paying attention to each moment, laughing, learning, letting go of things that bother us, paying attention to our thoughts and how they work and then understanding geological and cosmological time really puts everything in perspective. Loving, making new friends, not uh, sending out negative energy, not saying negative things to people, avoiding violence, all of these things will keep us free from suffering. Everything in martial arts is about awareness. It's about understanding the preciousness of life and how easily it can be taken. Therefore, I enjoy each day like I am with you. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you had a good time as I did. I love these little talks that we do because not everything can be about the physical martial arts. Sometimes just hearing someone's voice can make our day a little bit better. And I thank you for joining me and being part of this awesome community that we've built here. Thank you for being part of it. We'll see you on the next q and I don't know when it will be. But I'm going to go and work on something martial art related. Have a great day, everybody, or night, wherever you are. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.